We had um, 75 people register for today and um, we're delighted to have you with us. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead with the introduction and I think some other people will join us um, as we get going. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody to this virtual European experience. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kathy Wood and along with my husband, Charlie, I'm the founder of European Experiences. And we are really excited about the opportunity to travel from home with everybody over the next few months through these virtual experiences. Today, we're going to be traveling to a region that's very special to me, um, to Alsace. And it's a very unique region in France that truly is between France and Germany. Um, I do need to tell you, we are still learning about Zoom. <laughs> so we ask you to bear with us if we have any glitches. Um, and we'll ask you um, at the end of the meeting to give us a little feedback if you have any about that. So I just wanna say a few things about how the program will work. Um, this is a webinar, um, it's not a Zoom meeting, it's a webinar and you won't be visible today. Maybe that's a good thing for you. Um, you'll just see the presenters, myself and Kelly and any visual aids that we have. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Zoom webinars, just uh, something I wanna tell you that we learned from last week. When, you, when we use slides, you can decide if you still wanna see the presenter. They'll be in a small box somewhere on your screen. If you would rather not see the presenter, then you can hide the that little screen. Just hover over the little box and you'll see a line and a blue box. Uh, the line hides the small screen. You can also move that little screen around on your own laptop or tablet, whatever you're watching on, by just dragging it to where you want it. <clears throat> Today, we're going to do things a little differently. If you were with us for kind of our practice session last week on a different topic. Today, we're going to take a couple of breaks for questions during the presentation. Um, if you have a question at any time, you can type it in using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and you can type in a question at any time. At the end of the session, We'll ask you to respond to a short feedback survey. It should pop up when we end the meeting. Um, I hope it didn't work this week. I think I did it right this time. Um, you'll also receive a link to that same survey tomorrow um, with a follow-up email. So please don't answer the survey twice. Um, there is not a charge for these sessions. Um, I know some companies are doing that, but um, we decided not to do that. But we do want to recognize the time and the effort of our presenters um, who weren't able to work with us this year or really for much of anyone else. So if you enjoy the session and you feel like you can make a small donation, that would be wonderful. You know, we're suggesting 10 to $20 and 100% of that will go to the presenter. Um, you can pay by personal check through Venmo, um, if you're outside of the US through TransferWise um, or PayPal. And you can find the info on our website at www.european-experiences.com forward slash payments. And I will show that link at the end of the program um, because I know there's a lot to keep up with. So I wanna tell you about our presenter today. And I think you all know I'm especially pleased and proud to introduce her. Um, this is someone I've known uh, in her entire life. It's uh, Charlie and my daughter, Kelly Wood. Um, Kelly made her first trip to Europe to Paris when she was just 14 months old. And uh, that was the beginning of something really big for her. She's been traveling, studying and living in Europe um, really her entire life. Um, she's also been part of our European Experiences team since the very beginning, uh, back in 2006. Um, she joined us on our summer trips when she was a teenager. She helped make notebooks and do other projects at home. Um, with us, she co-led two Luberon experience groups with Charlie in 2014. And she also has been an important part of our research team in the Cotswolds of Paragore and Alsace. And these days she's also handling our Instagram posts. And I, I think maybe some of you have, have met her over the years. Um, Charlie's now mostly retired. And so Kelly will be my co-leader for our um, Paragore and our Alsace trips. And as soon as we, we are able to get there, she's going to work with me to research a new trip in Normandy. Um, just a little academically about Kelly. Um, she has a bachelor's in international studies from the University of Chicago. 
Um, she has two master's degrees from uh, Columbia University and the London School of Economics in international and world history. And she's now in her fourth year. Uh, she's a PhD candidate in modern and European history at New York University. So with that, let me turn it over to Kelly. Sorry. Can can everyone see me? We'll just I can. We'll just assume everybody can. And are you recording? Because I it doesn't say that you're recording. I did click recording. Oh, okay. Hi everyone. Let me just um, share my screen. Um, Kathy, sorry. Can you make it possible for me to share my screen? Oh, sorry. It's all right. Yeah, did you not see somewhere to do that? It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay. Okay, I think you're good. I am good. Okay. Um. Okay, hi. So, um, again, my name is Kelly, and uh, the talk that I'm going to be giving today, or the webinar rather, um, is about Alsace and its position between France and Germany. And um, this is, oh gosh, sorry, I'm not very good at uh, PowerPoint, so I don't use them that often. So um, this actually started for me when we were uh, researching for the Alsace Experience tour, um, and we in the town of Kinsheim where we stay, um, on the side of a church um, in the main square is the picture here on the right. Um, and it says, uh, in honor memory of our 51 um, citizens who were uh, forcefully incorporated into the German army from 1942 to 1945, of which 25 lost their lives. Uh, remember, we remember their sacrifice uh, under a, uh, like a hated uniform for a cause that wasn't their own. And, and then it cites the um, decree that allowed them to be incorporated into the German army. And so similar, similarly, in the town of Kaisersburg, there's another kind of plaque. It's on a big, in France, they call it a stell. And it's just like a um, big chunk of rock with this kind of placed in it. And um, it tells us that 13, 130,000 young men from Alsace and the Department of Moselle were incorporated by force into the German army. And in Alsace, they named them the Malgré Nu uh, because it was against their will. So Malgré Nu in English, it means in spite of ourselves or against our will because they were forced to, care, to wear a hated uniform that represented a regime that they hated. And 30,000 of them were killed, most of them on the Eastern Front. 10,000 of them are still missing without a burial site on different, and from different uh, battlefields. And 40,000 of them were injured or were invalids after the war. And something that's gonna be really important for my talk today is how this plaque finishes. It says, Alsace is a French region, is the French region that paid the price, the heaviest price for the uh, criminal folly of Nazism. And so this really sparked my interest about a region kind of paying a price for an entire country, for an entire movement. And this, you know, these plaques that are everywhere is what really got me interested in this topic, which is something, which is what I wrote my master's uh, dissertation on and something that is still part of my research that I work on today. So I think that something really special about our tours is you know, you get to explore so much that you just see these little kind of pieces of history that can really spark something greater for you, or at least for me, they did. Um, and so I'm just going to start with a geographical introduction to the region because I think that's quite important. So, um, and if at, if at any time you have questions, um, you can just type them in. And um, I'm going to take some periodic breaks just to check in on that. So that we don't, you know, if you have a question about this, it's not 40 minutes later that I'm going to be answering your question. So um, here is a map of Europe. 
And you, the circle, the region, the area that I've circled here is the region of Alsace-Lorraine. And you can kind of see that it butts into Germany a little bit. And if you were to continue the western border of Germany down to the southern border, you would then chop off this little chunk of France. And so because it is part of, or it has been part of France and has been part of Germany, you, you can see in the geography at least why this is, um, it might be contested around the borders. Also, um, the current borders right now, the eastern border of the region is uh, the Rhine River. But the, 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 these departments, this region is bordered on the west by a mountain range. So for the French, the, the natural border for them is the river. Whereas for the Germans, the natural border would more likely be this mountain range called the Vosges. And we're gonna zoom in now a little bit on this because there's a lot of different terms that you can use for this region. Um, so we have Alsace and we also have Lorraine. And the region of Alsace is actually just two departments in France, um, the Bas-Rhin and the Ora, so the very uh, eastern departments here. Those are what constitute um, the kind of cultural region of Alsace. And the other four departments here, Moselle, Meurthe, Vosges, and Meuse, are Lorraine. And the reason this is important, which I will uh, kind of follow up on shortly, is because when Germany annexed this region, these departments were put into different um, administrative, um, cat administrative areas in Germany. So they didn't experience, they didn't have the same wartime experiences. So it's really important, and I'm gonna try and be diligent in this talk, that I kind of maintain this um, integrity of the terms because um, they didn't experience the same uh, trials during the war. And so for our intents and purposes, Alsace-Moselle is the region that I'm going to be talking about during the war. So that would be Department 68, Department 67, and Department 57. Um, so move on. And before I get to um, Alsace during World War II, I just want to explain why I'm going to focus on World War II right now. And that's, mo that's because that's what I know the best. That's what I've studied for almost six years now, well, almost five years now. And I would like to give you the best uh, like virtual experience today and have you come away with like the most like nuanced knowledge that you can. And so I'm just gonna gracefully glide over the two words that preceded it real quick for only for the purpose of explaining that this region has been passed between France and Germany four times. Um, in about 75 years. So in 1870, 1871, uh, the Franco-Prussian War was fought. And after the, Prussian, uh, the Prussians won the war, Germany was unified. And part of the, um, the treaty after the war was that Germany annexed the region of Alsace. And so during World War I, after the French won, they re-annexed the region of Alsace. So it went, France, Germany, France, that's three times already. And again, then the, as the Germans um, crossed the border of France and fought a extremely shortened battle uh, after which point the French capitulated after just six weeks, uh, the armistice that was signed didn't mention re-annexing the region of Alsace. However, um, they did anyways. And for the duration of the war from 1940 to 1944, 1945, um, Alsace was German again. And then only after the French and the Allies won the war did Alsace return to France. So in a very short span of time, the region has been kind of pushed back and forth between uh, these two countries with very different cultures and dialects. And so during World War I, uh, the French engaged in this, or after World War I, when the region returned to France, um, the French engaged, engaged in a process of, for lack of a better word, Frenchification. It sounds like a fake word, but it's one that's used, um, in which they tried to um, teach these citizens who had been Germans for 40 years 
almost 50, the French language, French culture, French customs, streets were renamed back into French. So it was a quite a process. Imagine, why well, I, I don't wanna, you know, get political or anything, but I'll speak a random country. Imagine that we were annexed by India. The process that we would go through in just a couple of years of having to, you know, engage in a completely different culture and assume all of these different um, practices, including education, was a really intense one for these Alsatians. And um, something else that I should note um, is that before the war, the, um, in 1905, France issued this proclamation that um, church and state would be separated. But once Alsace returned to France after, the, after World War I, this was not um, applied to the region. It's part of the attempt to um, integrate the Alsatians back into France with making some con concessions. And that included um, having a different kind of relationship between the church and the government in this area. And this is still the case today. Um, so, and I'm gonna scurry and fast forward to um, 1940 now. And I don't want to get too um, bogged down in the intricacies of this, but I think something for me that's exciting about history is like getting to see the actual documents that propelled certain things to happen. And so this is the digitized version from Yale of the armistice agreement between France and Germany that was signed in June 1940. And so articles two and three, which are included in the screenshot here, and I hope it's not too small for you to read, but um, I can also read that out or kind of summarize it for you. But essentially, excuse me, essentially these two articles um, determine how the country of France is going to be split up administratively and politically and militarily um, for the, I wouldn't say the duration of the war because for these two countries the war is over, but you know, until Germany's war is over. And these two, in these two um, articles, all this isn't mentioned at all. And it would probably not be that surprising that Alsace wasn't mentioned because although Germany had continued to kind of lay claim to the region of Alsace in the interwar period, in 1938, Hitler fit officially renounced claims to the region and it no longer became part of his platform to um, kind of engage in military uh, battles or with the French. Oh, I have a question. Okay, let me just finish this section and then um, I'll get to the question. And so would it necessarily be so surprising that it wasn't mentioned? What becomes surprising that, that it wasn't mentioned is because the region was annexed after the war. And I'm gonna move to a um, picture that might show this a little bit better. So France was split into two sections. Um, the Northern zone, which was, and the, uh, border, the part of France that borders the Atlantic, um, when it fell under German occupation. So the capital um, or the political capital was moved to Vichy, France, which you can see just under the red line, kind of in the middle of the country. And so Paris was still the cultural capital and was where the Nazis kind of consolidated their power for the occupation zone. Um, Free France or Vichy France, if you will, was the Southern zone. And so Alsace would naturally be in the occupation zone of the North, but what was different about it is that it was essentially annexed. The region fell under German administration, a special German administration, and that the rest of Germany was under, whereas the Northern part of France did not, the rest of the occupied zone of France did not fall under that. Um, so let me just look at the questions. I don't know how to do that. Oh, here we go. Can you explain more about the influence of the church in Alsace? Yes, I will. Um, I can return to that at the end. I'll make a note and I'll return to that at the end. Um, so here you see, um, it's obviously not all of the um, territory that the Nazis control, but here are their administrative divisions. And you can see in the area that I circled um, how Alsace, so the Bahram, the Oran, and Moselle became part of this uh, administrative region or a Gau called Baden, whereas Lorraine fell under the administrative region called Westmark. 
and but the rest of northern France occupied them did not. So this effectively amounted to an, an illegal or unofficial annexation of these departments. Um, and again, this is why I was uh, being a little picky about my terminology earlier is because these different departments fell under different administrative divisions with different, it's basically like a state, we could think of it on that level. And so they had different governors or galliters and these governors pursued very different policies. Okay. Okay. Um, did I skip any? Oh. And I just thought um, you might like to see this picture of, this is Strasbourg um, in 1940. And this is the Place de la République. So it's the northern part of Strasbourg and it's where um, a lot of the um, departmental administration buildings are as well as the um, university in Strasbourg. And there's quite a large park out front. And what had once been the Palais du Rhin, so um, to my best of my knowledge, that was kind of like the um, like the where the governor's office would have been for the French, it then became the um, building out of which the the Nazi commandeur was. And I'll come back to this air this um, Place République near the end because it's uh, quite an interesting um, location where you see a lot of the tensions between uh, France and Germany. So. I'm just going to move to my next section of my notes. Does anyone have any um, other questions about um, kind of annexation of Alsace-Lorraine before I move? It's okay if you don't. I just wanted to check before I move forward. Okay. Well, doesn't it can't stop you from asking those questions later. So um, next, I'm going to talk about the Germanization and Nazification of all deaths. And so, um, okay, so the Gauleiter or the governor of Baden, which, which included all deaths Moselle, his name was Robert Wagner. And he, this is the cover of a book about him. I didn't want to get into licensing issues. So I took a cover of a book. Um, although, anyways, um, and he was known as the butcher of all deaths. And it's not just because of his kind of administrative policies, but because he allowed for um, the extermination of a massive number of Jews in the area. And so, um, let's see. Um, Robert Wagner was appointed the Gauleiter of this region in August 1940. And although Hitler had expected that it would take 10 years for Alsatians to become completely Germanized, um, Wagner ensured Hitler that the region would be appropriately integrated into the Reich within only five years, which um, I have, which I imagine is a testament to his, um, the zealousness of his campaign throughout the region, which also the fact that he was known as the Butcher of Alsace kind of um, implies as well. He had um, an essentially unchecked rule in Alsace that contributed to the unique wartime memory of Alsatians. And in September 1940, he received autonomy over his budget and the right and duty to proceed with Germanization according to the methods he judged appropriate. And all that was required of him is that he tell uh, the chancellery what he was doing. So under Wagner, there was a prohibition on speaking the French language uh, he waged a war on patriotic French monuments and French words, including street names, first names, and last names. The University of Strasbourg was transformed into a national socialist university, and undesirable racial elements were expelled from the departments, and they were expelled into the interior of France. Um, this, so this might, this, the changing of first name and last names kind of explains why in all that today you might meet someone whose name is Francois, uh, oh gosh, I need to just think of a really good German last name real quick. Francois Wagner, if you will. You know, you have a French first name and a German last name or a German sounding French name, 
first name and a French sounding last name. Furthermore, um, Wagner uh, opened a, a concentration camp called Struthof and a re-education camp called Schirmeck, which were housed, which were constructed to mostly house subversive elements from within the region. So that would be uh, resistors to the Nazi movement. Um, young men and women in the region were also forced to register for uh, the Reichsarbeitsdienst, which was the German work service, and young boys were also forced to enroll in the Hitler Jugend, which was the Hitler Youth. Um, and so this was completely different than even what the Gauleiter of um, Westmark, which is the other, where the other parts of Alsace-Lorraine were incorporated into, and vastly different from what happened in northern France. Uh, French children were not expected to join, you know, any kind of Nazi movement related to Hitler or just Nazi movement at all. Um, the language wasn't attacked. In fact, um, German military officials quite enjoyed the culture of France while they were there, but in, attempt, in an attempt to incorporate the region and its, you know, what Hitler and Wagner believed like the, to be the appropriately Aryan um, population, they had to kind of indoctrinate them into the German culture. Um, and so at this point in 1940, what's my next slide? Um, at this point in 1940, oh, I'm sorry, I feel a sneeze coming on. The, um, German or Alsatian men were not forced to, to join the German army. In fact, a number of them in 1940 had been fighting for France against the Germans and were likely to have been placed in a prisoner of war camp until their um, regional uh, home was determined, at which point they would have been returned to Alsace. So it's um, interesting to think that you know you could have you could have been a French man fighting against Germany and then come home to end up being essentially a German man. So um, for Wagner, the idea of conscription was another way to indoctrinate and incorporate young men who had been educated in the French system and to integrate them into the German state. And although he justified the conscription of Alsatians by claiming wide popular support in the region and a wide desire for Alsace to become a part of the, of the Reich, it was actually a, quite a practical measure because of a massively failed campaign to recruit Alsatians into the SS. In fact, the proportion of Alsatians who volunteered for the German army was much less than that of volunteers from the rest of France. And so um, something that might become to seem apparent here is that Alsatians actually had quite a strong, uh, or Alsace has a quite a strong culture of its own. They have their own dialect, Alsatian. They have their own flag. And if you are in Alsace and you travel to the rest of France, you feel that it's different. And it is, in my mind, quite a bit different than the rest of Germany. And so that's quite it's a unique regional identity. And so in my uh, opinion, I think that's why um, so many of them didn't feel pulled to, or so, so many le less of them than the rest of France joined the German army because it wasn't about being on the side of the victor or not, but it was, they were really kind of tied to the region. And I think in my mind, they're kind of tired of being pushed back and forth between France and Germany. But so in August of 1942, after several uh, lesser measures, uh, Wagner issued an ordinance that announced required military service for Alsatian men, beginning with men born between 1920 and 1924. And up to this point, only 2,100 Alsatians had volunteered for the Wehrmacht or the SS. But as the war progressed, more and more classes were incorporated, including those of the soldiers who had fought uh, for France against the Germans in the Battle of France in 1940, and also boys under the age of 18. Um, and because of these two measures, the fact that children were incorporated into the army, 
and second, that the region hadn't been formally annexed under the, the armistice, and therefore the men being uh, forced to join the army were not legally German. Um, the forced incorporation of more than 130,000 Alsatians violated Articles 44 and 45 of the Hague Convention of 1907. Um, and just a line from the Article 45, it says, it is forbidden to compel the inhabitants of occupied territory to swear allegiance to the hostile power. And so according to the, the armistice agreement, which is why I showed it to you at the beginning here, is that Alsace is only really ever included in the occupied territory and the annexation was kind of a de facto um, illegal annexation. And so a lot of people, have kind of challenged the idea of the Malgrain New and said, well, why didn't they just do what the rest of um, the Frenchmen did when they were called to into the work service for the Germans and um, evade uh, their military service and go into hiding? And then why didn't they just fight for the resistance instead? And the problem is that soldiers who refused to present themselves for their orders or who deserted were themselves jailed or sent to Struthof, the re-education camp, or if they couldn't be found, their family, family members were relocated to Germany or sent to be re-educated as well because they were believed to be guilty of not having raised their children in the service of the German homeland. So it doesn't matter that they had just been French. Um, the Germans imagined that the region always had this really strong tie to the country of Germany. And so, this sets us up, up for um, the uh, to for me to talk about the group called the Malgrenu, which again means um, against our will or in spite of ourselves, um, but it's a noun here used um, to refute, uh, refer to this group of men. Um, and so here's a photo of a group of um, Malgrenu. And the sign that they're holding says Song Patrice, which means without country. And it's dated May 1st, 1943. So this is after um, Wagner's uh, decree was issued. And the, for me, the placard that says Song Patrice is really indicative of the fact that they feel that they're kind of pulled between these two countries. And in that case, it makes sense that they would revert more to the regional to the region of Alsace and identifying with the region itself rather than one or the other country. Because you never knew when there was gonna be another war and you were gonna be, uh, oh no, forced to do that. Okay, so um, I have a couple questions. Oh, thank you, Margie, that's very kind that I can't answer right now. Um, so there is a group called Malgray L, which is, um, and means, in spite of themselves, or in, whereas Malgré New means in spite of ourselves, right? New in French means we or us. The group Malgré L, L means them, but the female. So the fact that they're not inclu included in this term of us is, from a gendered perspective, really interesting. But the Malgré L were not um, conscripted to fight um, like on a battlefield per se, but they were conscripted into um, like behind the line jobs, as well as into the uh, work service. And so there is um, some research done about that. And there, so they were conscripted kind of in a way, um, but it doesn't have the same kind of resonance as uh, the, the group of men. And the women have, have you know, indeed sought to be um, recognized more for what they suffered during the war. Um, so the re-education center is located in Schirmeck, um, which is near the concentration camp of Struthof. And when I um, finish this, uh, I can make another note again. Um, I can pull up, I can share on my screen a map of the air region if you'd like to show you um, where this would be kind of in relationship to everything else. Um, I'll remember that. Okay, so, okay, so I have been told that I need to speed up. Sorry, I just love talking about this. 
and there's so much background. So um, this is the information about the Malgré Nu. Um, a lot of them did fight on the Eastern Front, which is where the, by 1942, where the, um, like the center of the war had moved, fighting against the Soviet Union. And so by nature of the fact that they were fighting against the Soviet Union, and that at this point in time, um, Germany was really starting to, you could start to see that Germany was losing the war, especially now in retrospect, we see that this was really a turning point. Um, a lot of these men were uh, captured as prisoners of war and um, kept held at Soviet prisoner of war camps, which um, one might also call a gulag. Um, and so in the memory of Alsace, when they think about the Malgrini, there's kind of a two part memory. The first is that they were forced to fight for the Germans who they didn't have much sympathy for or um, loyalty to really at all. But then there's a second part that they were then held in these concentration camps uh, or in these prisoner of war camps and the last men were not released until 1955, 10 years after the war. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more just about that at the end. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speed, speed through now, Kathy. So um, they, there's just kind of two part uh, trauma, if you will, about how after the war, these men weren't um, repatriated, you know, with the knowledge that they've been forced to fight for the Germans, that they were actually French. And often when they were captured, some of them would try to, would have um, little pins or symbols of being French or Alsatian kind of hidden on their uniform. And Soviet soldiers would often disregard this because they thought it would just be, a t it was a tactic on behalf of um, like true or ethnic Germans. So um, I'm gonna oh go ahead here now. And oh, so something that what I have studied from my research um, and something that really brought the case of the Malgrini to the forefront in French memory is the fact that they were involved in the largest massacre in France during the war. Um, their unit had been fighting on the Eastern Front. This one unit had been fighting on the Eastern Front and was on kind of a vacation or rest, if you will, in the south of France. Um, and then when the landings at Normandy happened in the beginning of June, they were rushed up to uh, help the, the German troops who were already up there. And so this unit was not just Malgrenu, they were um, mixed in with other uh, like ethnic German soldiers. And although many of them had been incorporated into the Wehrmacht, which is the army of the country of Germany, um, many of them had then been transferred over to the SS, which was um, like the Nazi party's uh, fighting body. And so uh, if you might have heard talked about this massacre in the town of Orador, which is actually quite near to where um, our Paraguay experience is. And essentially, um, just to really quickly move through it, uh, 642 French men, women, and children were killed in this massacre. And what was quite interesting about it is that some of them had been relocated, had been voluntarily or forcefully relocated from the area of Alsace in 1939 and 1940. And to this area, France, in the center of France, so some of the people who were killed in this massacre were Alsatians, and some of them were killed by Alsatians. It was quite um, a horrific massacre. And it's only the middle of the day, so I don't wanna you know, ruin your day with the details of it. Um, but it was so horrific, if you will, and it had such a, represented so much the kind of sacrifice that France made, you know, for the rest of the allies um, under Germany that there was a trial after the war. And I just quickly, what I'm gonna talk about, um, because this is what I've done a lot of my research about. The trial was meant to prosecute those men involved in the massacre. However, a number of French, uh, German men had been killed throughout the rest of the war. Some were serving as um, CIA informants and uh, the CIA refused to um, give them up for the trial. So on trial were 14 Alsatians and only seven Germans, whereas a majority of the, the unit that had perpetrated the massacre were German. So for Alsatians, it really felt like a, you know, Alsace itself was on trial, especially when they felt that they were the victims in this case, that they didn't want to fight 
and this is what brings me to what I think I had in my kind of description of this talk is that Alsace was a spoil of war and they were constantly passed back and forth. And that after each of these wars, they call themselves like the booty for each of the, the victors, you know, that there was really no concern about the people themselves, but more a uh, desire to have the land that had uh, quite nice farming territory and also mining. And so it really wasn't about the people, it was just like a spoil of war. And they felt really victimized, you know, through this whole period of 70 years of just being passed back and forth. Um, and it kind of came to a boiling point. And so in this picture on the left, you see a protest about the trial where 25,000 Strasburgers, <laughs> such a funny word, um, are marching through the streets. In the background, you can kind of see like a dark figure. Um, and that is this statue here um, on the left. And it's been covered in a black veil to symbolize mourning. And this is the, the statue um, today. It's unfortunate when I took this photo, there was a man just casually sitting in front of a statue about a lot of dead Alsatians, but alas. So this statue is covered and it represents, we have this woman and she's like the Alsatian patrie and she's holding a French and a German man in her arms. And you can't tell who is who. And so they're just, you know, men in this case, they're not defined by their nationality or, you know, the country to which they're meant to belong. And it represents all these cases in which these Alsatian men were kind of forced to fight. And it was, it was constructed after for the First World War, but it became, after the Second World War, a really big place of symbolic protest for Alsatians. Um, so this is from the beginning. I still have three minutes, Kathy. The Place de République. This is the, the kind of green space in front of it, where this is. So you can tell it's a really important area, uh, location in the town. So I just go back um, really quick. So I, I mentioned the street signs earlier, how it was kind of used, to, how they were kind of used to further Frenchify or Germanize these towns. And here um, it says uh, the, the, the square is actually called Place de Bordeaux, but uh, someone mailed this to the mayor of Strasbourg and crossed it out and said Place de Bordeaux. So this, this trial really became a huge contention point. And um, this poster on the left was made by a veterans association. And these, these are the names of the, um, it's really thir 13 Alsatians. Um, one of the ones on trial had volunteered for the SS, but this is kind of echoing these posters that the Nazis put up during the war, um, noting the um, punishments for resistors who had been captured. So they're kind of equating their position to that of people had suffered under the Nazis and they're equating the French government prosecuting them to kind of the Nazis in this case. And so it's a really interesting um, symbolic action. And at the bottom it says, these are not the ones who are responsible. And so they're really trying to call on the country of France and the countries of Germany to take responsibility and not pass it off on these men who have, you know, who represent a region that's so constantly been kind of shoved off. Um, and then it, on this poster on the right, I just have this here to, because they're meeting at the Monument of the Dead. And so it's in a different town, it's in the town of Hagenau, but these Monuments to the Dead continue to be kind of a rallying point. Um, and so I just su sum up what happened at the end of the trial. Um, all 14, obviously including the one who had volunteered were found guilty. Um, to appease the town of Orador and the rest of France, but then shortly after, the Parliament rescind, or granted an amnesty to these men, so they were didn't have to serve their um, was like the their years of hard labor in prison. But again, they felt like this was oh, Kathy's here to cut me off. Again, they felt like this was um, quite a quieter action and not that it didn't have the same national importance. And so I just want to sum up, hopefully quickly by saying that um, the region does have quite a contested history and it has been just kind of passed back and forth because the, the territory itself has quite 
a meaning to these countries, but the people feel like they don't matter as much. And so the case of the Malgrenu and how they were treated after the war, on trial, not being returned from camp for 10 years, um, kind of demonstrates this, this fact. And that is one reason why I believe that they resort to kind of identifying with the region more rather than either country. So um, I'm sorry to rush through that, I am not practiced in time management, I suppose, but I, I hope that was informative. Oh, Kathy, can I answer this question from Lily? Yeah, very quickly while okay. I change the screen. How are they treated after the war? Um, Lily, I actually don't know so well the answer to this question. I know um, I've seen it like kind of mentioned places. Um, but I get this, I have the sense that the region really identified more with the people and kind of the, their trauma. And so that they sympathized with them more than maybe the rest of France would have. And so they weren't, um, so, uh, kind of isolated from the, you know, the communities in this area. However, I do believe that those who volunteered would have had this experience. I don't know about the sisters and mothers of the men during the war, besides, you know, the fact that women would have been conscripted into the work service. And if their family, if they're the man of their family had um, not shown up to receive his orders, they would have been put into a camp. And while my mom talks about our tours, uh, Rebecca, I'm gonna go find a map of Shermec that I can pull up really quick. Okay, Kathy. I just want to briefly tell everybody, and thank you, Kelly. Um, she had a lot of uh, enthusiasm and she has a lot of information and I hope that you did learn a lot about the uniqueness of, of Alsace. Um, we love this area um, and the kind of cultural combination, the cultural uniqueness is one of um, the things we most enjoy about it. We, we actually have two trips um, in Alsace and I think some of you have been in, in both of these trips. We have a seven night Alsace experience. Uh, we've been offering that trip since 2016. Um, we've had eight groups there and we stay in the village of Kintzheim, a very um, beautiful, authentic village, which is less than a mile from um, a bigger, more uh, a famous touristed village called Kaisersburg. Um, we have one trip hopefully um, next year and then we'll be back there again in um, 2023. That sounds a long way away. Um, and we also have a Christmas tour. Um, we have a 12-day trip called the European Christmas Experience. Um, we're in three different countries and we have four different bases. And the last four nights are in Colmar, um, which is the uh, sort of main town in the um, southern part of Alsace, or one of the main towns. It's considered to be the capital of um, of the the wine region of Alsace and uh, we've done that trip four times it's fabulous I'm going to do a talk on the Christmas markets later we're definitely doing that trip in 2022 and if there's enough interest also in 2023. Kelly did you want to jump in and say something or? Yeah, I had I had a map that I just wanted to um, pull up if that wouldn't be too onerous for you Kathy. Yeah I'm supposed to finish in one minute so we okay. might and follow up with Rebecca separately. She okay, I'm trying to find my map again. Would it would it be surprising that I misplaced my map? Um, Kelly, I'm moving on. Okay, move on. Okay, everybody can observe our mother-daughter dynamic here. So um, I want to just give you a preview of the upcoming virtual Euro European experiences. Um, I'm going to do a repeat, um, hopefully slightly improved, of um, my session on the gardens of the Cotswolds on Monday, um, for those of you that might not have known about that before. And then next Friday, um, I'm very excited that uh, Jennifer Dugdale, who worked with us in Provence, um, she's going to be with us in her kitchen in Provence um, uh, doing a session on uh, French food and traditions, and it will include a little kick cooking demo. And then on the 15th of October, that's a Thursday, um, our dear friends Ariana, um, and who's our co-leader now for Chianti, uh, along with her husband Alessio, and our good friend Francesco, 
who uh, runs his family winery um, outside of Panzano, they'll do a session on Into the Vineyard. So uh, we will we'll be promoting those more, but if um, those interest you, um, please do sign up. And we're working now on another round of uh, virtual programs that will take us into November. Um, so we really appreciate the response. Okay, Kathy, I found, oh, that's me. Um, yeah. Can I share my, my map really quick? Yeah. You have to unshare. Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, this is quite an informal map. Uh, but to the, the east of France, where the two little black squares are here. Um, oh, that's a Q&A. Uh, you can see there's the Struthof, which is the concentration camp, and Schirmeck, which is the re-education camp. And actually now Schirmeck is a memorial uh, or a museum about Alsace-Moselle on that territory. And if you're at one or the other camp locations, you can see where it looks kind of across the valley of each other. So they're really kind of concentrated there. So um, we do visit Struthof on our tours. Um, but just because we don't want to overload everybody with the sad history of Alsace during the war, um, we don't visit Schirmeck. But it, if you continue your travels thereafter, it is quite an interesting place to go. Um, I can add a, um, give my mom and her follow-up email some suggestions of general history books that aren't too like onerous um, in that email. And then just Jennifer, really quick, um, the Malgré New were, you know, it's just like one month after they were released from their um, punishments. However, kind of the damage had been done and officially kind of largely, you know, the official decision had been that they were found guilty and amnesty didn't um, remove the judgment, it just removed the punishment. And so they were still officially found guilty, just they didn't have to serve um, the punishment. Okay. You're muted. Um, we, yeah, we do, we do need to, to wrap up and thank you all for being here. If you wanted to make a donation, if you're able to make a donation for today's talk, we suggest just a small contribution. Um, and we have set up a page on our website for payments, uh, European hyphen experiences, um, forward slash payments. And there are links there, uh, for Venmo or PayPal, as well as our address if you wanted to send a check. And everything that we receive for today's talk will, will go to Kelly. So thank you, everybody, again. Thank you, Kel, and uh, hope to see you again soon.